a few people still filtering in. Um, so we'll probably leave it until 32, 33 before we get started. Right, I'll give it uh, another 30 seconds and then we'll crack on. I'll keep an eye out for any late ones, Tom, if you want to get going. We'll die. I'll give it another 10 and then we'll die. There you go. <laughs> Someone's just emailed me as well. Let me just check. Um, right, spare me one second, Liam. I've just got to send. Someone's having problems. I'll just send them. Yeah. Right, let's get started. Um, still a few people filtering in. But as it says on the screen there, as soon as you're in, like most of you have done, if you can get on mute for us and uh, turn your cameras off, just when we do get to those high numbers, Having your cameras off just helps uh, the meeting flow uh, and especially with my internet cuts out any uh, silly internet uh, behavior. So hopefully it will work nice and smoothly for us tonight. Let's get the mouse on. Oh, and I can't move the slide. Great start. Why am I not able to move the slide forward? There we go, mouse wasn't working, needed a, a quick tap. Okay, so welcome everybody to the third club update of the season in this new year. On the call tonight, uh, presenting you've got myself, Tom Meacham, I'm the club support officer. You've got Claire McCrory, who is our designated safeguarding officer. You'll recognise her from last time. Tonight, we have also got Leon Derns, um, adult football development officer. Leon's on the call tonight. Uh, a number of the questions that you, you posted um, when you signed up were around leagues um, and the processes that they're going through. So Leon's going to jump on tonight um, and hopefully answer some of your questions around that. Um, before we do go on, um, let's just talk in. Oh, someone's. Okay, I've got my got my screen back. Um, there was some really sad news yesterday. Um, the passing of, of Darren Warner, someone that staff at the County FA know really well. 
Um, if you're not aware of him, Darren founded Club Doncaster Titans, um, and that club um, has provided opportunities to play football for a lot of people that may may not have had that chance. Um, I nearly said last year. In 2019, Darren won the BBC Unsung Hero Award for the Yorkshire region. Um, and I just want to share a quote that he said at the time, because I think it's really, um, really good quote and just something that is something for us to all kind of remember um, as why we do it, why, why we're all involved in football. So he said, I don't do it for the awards. I do it for the kids and the adults. It started because of my son. I was a parent getting involved because I wanted to get my son a game of football, and that's it. Um, I think that's something really important for us all, uh, working with clubs, working with young people, with adults as well, why we do it. At the end of the day, we want to get a game of football on for the people that want it. So um, a really sad loss, um, for obviously, for everyone involved up at Club Doncaster, his friends, his family, um, and, and the thoughts of everyone at the county FA are with Darren's family uh, and his friends at this time. What's on the menu for tonight? Okay, we've got a mental health and wellbeing um, info pack, listening to young people with Claire, a COVID guidance update, and you'll be pleased to hear that that is not me going on for 25 minutes tonight. It should be a swift one. Uh, an update on the COVID guidance breach procedures, feedback from the leagues, um, and any questions from yourself? So just a little bit on uh, what you've missed since last time, if you were with us and if you weren't. Uh, uh, how to play your part posters were updated. So we had one for players. There's now one for coaches. That is a fantastic tool, particularly um, for inexperienced coaches or coaches that haven't got uh, loads of years under their belt for how to play their part and keep sessions COVID safe. Now, we did a piece around training sessions last time, so I won't go back onto that, but there's some key clear messages, and that is adult and youth, as how to keep football safe as a coach. Um, so there, you can get that as PDF, you can get it as a PNG, so it will go in a WhatsApp group. So a really useful tool to send out to your coaches at all levels of football. And the club development page has had a revamp. The link's there when I send this out, you'll be able to click straight to that. We've had our latest, issue of more than a club which was around using social media and websites um, to support your clubs we did a piece on peniston church um, and their website so it was really really interesting piece wildcats application window is now open there's a direct link for you there 21 days of positivity respect information there charter standard fulfillment has, has commenced so you as charter standard club should start to receive information around that uh, and the most important piece of news, we have a new youth development officer. So as you may or may not be aware, Mike was working on reduced hours as he balanced um, university and a slight change in career path um, with his role. Um, and now we do have a full time youth development officer. Molly, she started in that role uh, after the turn of the year. She was with us from, I think, around March, February last year. So she's um, not new to the business, but new in, in role. So first and foremost, over to Molly, who, who's just going to introduce herself. Um, oh, someone's taking control of my breath. There we go. Who's uh, will introduce herself and go through what she's uh, what information she's got for you. Um, hi, I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself as the new youth development officer. Um, like Tom's just said. I'm going to be working alongside uh, Mike Drummond for the foreseeable future. Um, so I've got experience playing, refereeing and coaching. Um, so if you need any help or support, um, you can get in touch. Uh, I'm excited to work with clubs to continue to grow and improve football in this area. Um, so while I'm on this call, I just wanted to also take the opportunity to share with you about this exciting opportunity that has arisen to grow female football. Um, so some of you will know the Women's Euros is coming um, in 2022 um, and it's going to be hosted in Sheffield and also Rotherham. Um, so you can join um, this workshop and try and grow female football. It doesn't matter if you're not from Sheffield or Rotherham, you can still join in with, uh, with that workshop and it's available for anyone in our county. The workshops are broken down into two modules, each lasting 90 minutes. 
Um, so it's going to be a real good opportunity for everyone to get on board with that. And we want as many people to join as they can. Um, and obviously it's not really an opportunity that can be missed. So if, if everyone wants to get on that, if you can't attend the workshops, there's also a toolkit available on the link attached. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Molly. Um, as always, if you've got any any uh, questions or queries surrounding youth football, Molly can be your first point of contact through the usual uh, contact points. It'll be molly.johnson at sheffieldbay.com um, and she'll be happy to help. OK, so like I said, first little part of the presentation tonight is around mental health and wellbeing support for all in football. Um, I'm hoping, because Leon, I haven't checked this, that we've got Lisa and Sue. Um, we're currently working to improve the work we do as a county FA um, surrounding kind of the mental health and mental well-being of all our players, coaches, referees, club officials, all the stakeholders that we work with. Um, this kind of information pack is, is the first step really in what we hope is going to be a variety of support structures um, up to and including training for volunteers such as yourselves. Uh, before I hand over to Sue and Lisa um, to kind of explain what their roles are and what part they've got to play in this, um, we're doing it for a couple of reasons. So firstly, for us individually or for you individually, um, they, they are going to talk about um, the support strategies that they've got in place for yourselves. Um, which is really important, but also we're hoping that that will give you some sort of insight too. Um, if you're ever in a situation, whether that's with a player, whether that's with someone out of football, a friend or someone you work with, a colleague, that, that you think does need support or they ask you something, that you, you've then got some sort of uh, basic knowledge to signpost them to, to somewhere where they can be supported and looked after. So there's two reasons for doing this for yourselves and then obviously to try and hopefully empower you a little bit if you're ever in that situation. So I'm hoping that I can hand over uh, to Sue first if you're on the call. Uh, yeah, I am. Thanks ever so much, Tom. Um, and thanks to all of you for letting me join you for a few minutes this evening. Uh, my name's Sue and I'm a listening volunteer with Sheffield Samaritans. I'm sure you've heard of Samaritans. We're a national organisation. We've got over 200 local branches and about 20,000 volunteers. Um, although we uh, are an organisation, we're always very keen to be involved with what's going on in our community, uh, which is why I'm absolutely delighted that you've approached us. And we will involve the branches in Barnsley, Doncaster, Wakefield, I and mean, all the, the local areas covered by this. It won't just be Sheffield Branch, but for the moment, you've got Sheffield Branch. Um, and Samaritans generally do a lot of work with schools and other community groups. So this is, a, a, I think, a brilliant opportunity, not least because an awful lot of the people who will be involved in um, local football will be men. And um, we find that it is often men who find it most difficult to talk about their emotions. Um, although that's changing and it's becoming more acceptable and, you know, you can probably name more footballers than I have um, who've talked about their own emotional and mental health struggles for the last couple of years. So it is becoming more um, acceptable to do that and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, so this evening I just want to tell you a couple of things about what we do uh, that might be helpful to you um, and give you most importantly our telephone number because that's the thing that you really need. And as Thomas just said, maybe not now, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day you or somebody might need that phone number. So the first thing to do is to point you to our website, which is Samaritans.org. So there are two things that I think you might find useful. One is um, an initiative that we started about a year, maybe longer ago, called Real People, Real Stories. And this is where we got a lot of men involved in talking about um, their kinds of emotional issues and, and mental health worries. Um, and we found that for a lot of them, it was incredibly helpful. Just, you know, that cliche about a trouble shared is a trouble half. Well, it's not a cliche for no reason. Um, so Real People, Real Stories was, was very successful. And I would urge you to look at the, some of the stories on there. Um, we also have a, a self-help app. 
um, and I'm not going to go into maths details about it, but the it is designed to help you cope, feel better and stay safe when you're going through a difficult time. We've all been through difficult times, we're all going through a difficult time at the moment, but everybody will respond differently. You may know somebody who's had COVID, you may have been bereaved, you may be going through difficulties yourself, you may just be fed up to the back teeth with not being able to go out. Um, and all of those worries are things that are really bad if you bottle them up. Um, so this self-help app helps you to examine how you're feeling and recognize how you're feeling and find the things that will help you get through. And the fact that you've been through difficulties before means that you've already got techniques and tips. You know what makes you feel better, but they don't often come to the front of your head um, when you're feeling very down. So that's the first thing is what's on the website. The second thing is that, um, and it, it sort of flows from the first one, is that we've been around for almost 70 years. And so I think we can say with some authority that we know can really helps. Um, we run sessions and we can run sessions for you um, on emotional health and on listening. Um, listening skills are really important. Um, Samaritans are trained to listen and believe me uh, from my training it, it, it's quite a skill that I've learned that I don't think I really had before. Um, so talking is important. The third thing is that we're not doctors or counsellors, um, we are simply people who've been trained to listen. We don't give advice, we don't judge, and our service is confidential. We will listen to anyone who's in distress or despair. A lot of people think that you can only talk to a Samaritan if you are suicidal, that is not the case. Obviously, we will talk to people who've reached that, that stage, but if it's keeping you awake, if it's worrying you, then talk to us. Our telephone number is 116123. It's a free line and there is somebody on the end of that phone 24-7, 365 days of the year. And quite often at night, we are the only people available for people to talk to. Um, so please remember the number. If you need our service, please use it. I'm really looking forward to working with you all to develop um, ways of supporting you, doing some bespoke events, working with Flourish and other, other groups so that we're coming up with the best possible thing to help you through this. I think that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that, Sue. Um, I'm just going to move the slide across. I'll put that number in the chat in a moment and I'll also ensure that that's followed up on the uh, post meeting email as well. Thank you. Um, so, hopefully we've also got Lisa on the line with us. I've not seen her, Tom. I'm not sure if she's on, uh, but I can do it anyway if you need That's me to. Perfect, if you could, Leon. Yeah, sweet. Uh, she was supposed to join us, Lisa, but I know she was she a bit busy this evening, so it was a bit of hit and miss. But like, like Sue's just done, it was a bit of an intro into what Sheffield Flourish was as well. Uh, and these aren't the, uh, as Sue also said, these aren't the only two that we're looking to work with uh, within this partnership uh, for mental health and, and wellbeing in football. We're looking at getting Mind involved as a charity, which a lot of you are probably aware of, and, and a, a company called Ch uh, Chili Pep, a charity called Chili Pep, which, which works specifically in youth, mental health um, uh, and wellbeing. Uh, so like I say, it's, it's going to be a joint partnership where we're bringing everything in together. So we've got a really clear signposting of everything and anything that's going on within our county, both locally and nationally, uh, to help support players, volunteers, yourselves in club roles, uh, league roles, and even us as well. Um, we put this together because lockdown, uh, the stop and start of football is obviously affecting um, a lot of people more than ever. Um, but we also want this to be a continued partnership post, hopefully once we get out of this lockdown in due course uh, and back to normal life, we want, want to continue because it's, it's going to be ever there uh, and probably continue after, let us say. Um, just a bit on Sheffield Flourish, I'm not going into too much detail, so I know uh, I'm, I'm speaking for Lisa here, but there's a range of different things on their website um, from mental health stories, um, the, the mental health guide, which is brilliant, suicide support, which is another link to their, their website that they've got going. Uh, and they've also got the My Toolkit, uh, which is a, an online platform, uh, which you can could argue is a bit of a journal uh, where you put your thoughts down, you speak every day. Um, and that's something that is... Uh, People in Sheffield have found really helpful and obviously surrounding areas as well, um, both 
outside of football, but also it can relate to football as well. Uh, they have a, a, lo a load of bespoke uh, online weekly Zoom sessions at the moment. Obviously, they usually try and do things in person, uh, which we'll get back to, but at the moment, it's a lot of stuff online. Um, and it doesn't have to be football that they get involved in. Uh, but one thing they do run, Sheffield Flourish, is our um, Sheffield and Hampshire Flourish League, uh, which is specifically for disability and, and mental health participants, uh, offering a, an additional opportunity to anyone who's is potentially suffering with those sort of sort of areas within their, their daily life to get involved in football and use that as an output. Um, which obviously this is why we've got started looking into this because we've not got football running at the moment. It's probably affecting a lot of people. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll not I'll not delve on it any any longer. But this is something that we're looking to do, pushing forward. And and this opportunity now is just to introduce the idea and the partnership that we're, that we're looking to do. It'll be a lot of signposting through social media campaigns and and uh, online marketing websites, whatever that might be. Uh, but as Sue also said, we're looking to do a lot of bespoke um, sessions to support volunteers like yourself in the game, look for red flags, look for individuals and, and understand what, what the red flags might be and how to signpost and support them yourselves as well um, in, in, in football related, but also outside of football as well. Um, so it's a really exciting thing that we're, we're trying to get going that a lot of county FAs are doing uh, and we wanted to get on that as well. Um, started it in December and like I say we're looking to push it forward so um, watch this space and we're looking to get some more stuff out there in, in the coming weeks. Cheers Leon, I, I just want to reiterate that um, the app that Sue spoke about, that uh, the toolkit that you can see on your screen now, they're two fantastic tools and what I'd recommend for you as clubs is as and when we distribute information so I'll send this slide out separately as a PDF so you can click the links but as and when we distribute information through social media, through our website, through courses or whatever that is, that you take the time to, to distribute that to all your club members. Um, look, I, I know there can be some times, particularly uh, as Sue mentioned, we're in that kind of male demographic. It's a, sometimes seen as a sign of weakness or can be joked off uh, by certain people, but it's important and Nearly every club, every team that I've come across has got a team WhatsApp group, has got a club WhatsApp group, has got a, a par parent's email list. Um, so I'd recommend sharing that. And I know at times if you put it in the dog and ducks WhatsApp group, some of the lads will chirp back with a bit of banter. But you'd rather it be in there and take that banter for the one time that the person that doesn't throw the banter back needs it. Um, than, than worrying about what people think about you posting that. So I, I really, really want to push that we share and distribute this information so it reaches every single person that we're kind of working with as a football community so we don't miss anyone. So that person, that one person that might be struggling at whatever time that is in their life, they have got somewhere to go or they understand what support is out there for them. So really, really important that we push this as much as we can. OK, so we are going to be moving on now to youth engagement and the benefits with Claire. Yes, hello. Hello, everybody. Nice to see so many people on the call again this evening. Uh, I wanted to talk about youth engagement. It's something that is very important to us as a county FA and important to the FA generally. And I'm sure that some clubs have got really good tools and options in place, but maybe some people haven't thought about it so much or have thought maybe we could do a bit more. So I just want to try and give some ideas um, and some views on, on effective engagement. Now, as people may know, this Article 12 of the United Nations Convention, this is where it became established that young people should have a voice about anything that affects them. And the views that they bring forward should be considered. Obviously, it depends on the child's age and maturity. There are some things that wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, desires maybe that a young person might bring forward about a football session, say, that just wouldn't be able to happen like let's do all of our training um, in one of the big stadiums, um, Manchester United or something like that. But it does help to be able to, to build into your sessions opinions and views um, that are realistic and reasonable. It's helpful to get opinions, it's helpful to get that voice of the child because it means that we know that we've got the right activities in place and it also means that we know when we haven't got the right activities in place. If you allow participants to have that voice and you can build that trust with them, then your sessions will be um, better quality, more tailored to the needs of the participants, which is a very important thing for people to be able to feel as part of that club and that club structure. Thanks, Tom. Oh, let me click 
This is a tool that is used in youth work. It's called the ladder of participation. Again, some people here may have come across it. What we have here is a demonstration of, of a ladder of, of how things can happen and how engagement could be done. At the bottom is, is sort of the worst type of engagement where and what we really want to aspire to is being able to get to that number eight. So an example, you know, at the bottom is manipulation. Basically, you're asking a question, but you're actually at the same time giving the answer. So the question can't really go anywhere. You've done that. You've manipulated the answer. So that engagement is about manipulation. Uh, and then a, a same with decoration, you're getting answers so that you can say we've done some engagement, but actually the engagement isn't effective and isn't going to change anything. It's just there to say, yes, we've done some engagement. And if we move up through that ladder, if we can get to the top, that wonderful number eight, child initiated shared decisions with adults. And it does involve a lot more work and a lot more thought. And also you have to be realistic about what those um, what can actually be achieved as well. There's no point in saying you were going to do engagement about something that you know really down the line isn't going to be able to work um, or won't be able to be achieved. So it needs to be realistic. Um, and if it can be initiated by the child, if they've got an idea and they feel that they can come to you to share that idea and then potentially do some work and create change, then that's really, really good participation and engagement. Thank you, Tom. Talking, we've been looking this evening at mental health and as Leon and Tom have both said, we want to be able to drive good mental health for all members uh, that play football. If you think about putting people at the centre of their own journey, when people are feeling anxious or worried, at times at the moment, lots of there's lots of anxiety, people can't see where the future is going to go, people are worried, fearful for their own physical health, as well as the lack of opportunity and distraction that's there for people. And sometimes those thoughts can become very woolly within your mind and, and very confused. And that's what the picture in the middle uh, depicts, you know, the brain going, oh, no, you know, there's so many different things going on. I can't sort out all of these problems and I'm now confused and overwhelmed. And this is when people need to be able to find um, options to talk uh, and how to be able to communicate. Um, but people get worried about that as well. They don't know who to talk to and they also don't know what they could say, how could they possibly start that conversation off? Maybe people won't understand or they'll think that they're being stupid or they just need to get over it. And people feel like they're alone and they don't know what to do and where they can go to. What we want to do in clubs is make sure that engagement that you can have with your players and your club members can help that dialogue that talking so that people know that, that they could go to you, they could use you as a conduit for finding out information and to be able to share their anxieties. So we want to be able to create opportunities for your club members, whether it's young people, coaches, parents of some of your young players, that they know that they've got that engagement with you as a club. Tom? And how can we do this? How can we help? Um, so by listening to our players and other members, um, we can potentially get surveys out to them just as, as, as a starting point of engagement. At the moment, you have not got your eyes on your players, have you not, not got that opportunity to have that direct contact. So maybe sending out a survey, just a very quick survey to them, helps to mean that you're still maintaining that dialogue. You're still getting the information out there. You're still letting people know that you're there and you're still thinking about them. And that will help as well when we get back, hopefully back to football at uh, some date in the, in the wonderful future that we're all looking forward to. So potential questions could be, how do you feel? Uh, from one to five, one being really bad, five being absolutely amazing. You know, where are you on that scale so that people get an opportunity to reflect? What is it that you're missing about football? What are you doing instead? Are people getting the opportunity to get out and exercise, to talk with friends? Are they spending a lot of time on social media or playing computer games? Or is there other creative options that have come for them? And then a really important question is what would people be worried about when coming back to football? I think we all we all think it would be such a great thing when training restarts and when matches restart. But for some players, they might have anxieties about maybe their own fitness or um, relationships within their team, um, 
match atmosphere, uh, their own ability to achieve. There might be a number of things that people are worried about. And sending out a short survey like that could help to get some of those answers. And that's important because it means that with that information, you could potentially tailor some of your initial training sessions. You could say, right, well, if, actually, we've had a load of people said they're really worried about their fitness. So what we're going to do at the start is really focus on that. Or maybe we could put out some activities for them to do at home, you know, leading up to when football restarts. So just trying to get that um, idea of how you can use the information to then um, work with people and set out opportunities. And then for us, it's important because we would like to know that information. That means that we can we could effectively target some of our social media posting to external organisations or again to activities that people and players could do at home. So it's really important for us to get that information as well. Now I'm going to send out an email to club welfare officers tomorrow and I'll include this as a survey and ask people if they would be able to do it and then if they could let us know what sorts of answers they've had. And um, Tom? But another opportunity to engage, a very, very exciting opportunity, of course, is that we really want to have a great campaign for young people's mental health, promoting good mental health. And what we would like to do is to have uh, young people in clubs be part of that campaign, design that campaign so that we can use it. We'll promote it. It will be promoted by Samaritans, Flourish, um, Kit Locker. Um, oh, somebody's just exiting. Um, and then we will, oh, hang on, I've got something on my screen, so I can't see anymore. Uh, we, we do have amazing prizes. Um, so the first prize would be £100 worth of voucher of your choice, obviously within reason that's going to benefit the club. Um, and then an additional £25 voucher from Kit Locker. And then second place would be £50 voucher of your choice. So for the, for the club, it's worth doing as well. And it also means that you're having another route to engagement with your players who possibly haven't got very much to do at the moment. The closing date for this is the 8th of February. And the next slide just takes you through the brief uh, for it. So we want the campaign, it's a campaign, so we want it to be themed around anxiety. How, how do people feel listening or talking? Something that connects us with mental health. We need a really good slogan, a really nice catchy slogan um, that we can use for our campaign. Obviously, we need it to have a football link because we're talking, we're specifically targeting uh, players and we are a county FA, so we need it to have that link to football. The submission could be a computer generated uh, drawing or it could be a freehand drawing. Obviously, if it's freehand, then it would need to be posted to us. Um, but I do on the on our website, we've got all of the information about how people can enter. I didn't put on there, but it does need to be A4 as well so that we've got it established and we would like a phone number or a link for a support organisation to also be on that uh, on that poster. And then we would we'll we'll take that to our designer that we have who will sort of make it into what we need it to be in order to be able to use for social media. Uh, but yeah, as I said, there's information about that on the website. I'll send this out to Club Welfare Officers as well. And we've also got some um, social media going out, inviting people to join in with that. I hope that people will use it as an opportunity to make some contact with their players and that, you know, it gets people thinking about football again as well. That's all I needed to say. Um, but if you do have any questions on that at all, you can always get in touch with me by email or, or put it on the chat at some point during the course of the meeting. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, just again, want to reiterate everything Claire said there. Um, even for those of you based at adult clubs, 95% of what Claire's just mentioned spoke about there's relevant to you listening to your listening to your players, listening to your members um, is really, really important. Hopefully we get a nice response on, on this uh, post. It should be uh, uh, good to see the entries come in. Um, I don't know if I've been selected to be on the uh, on the panel yet, but we'll find that out later. Then. I'm, I'm auditioning, Tom. I'm auditioning. I'll keep you in mind. No, I've still got my what's on the mate that threw me there. Right, there's a strange title on the top of this slide. So on to the guidance. So easiest one so far this season. Football in the non-elite setting is currently suspended. So there is nothing happening at the moment. Um, I just want to take this moment to just thank you all again for your hard work prior to lockdown three, if that's what we're calling it. Um, 
it, it was really apparent that you as clubs are doing your absolute utmost to adhere to the guidance and keep the game as safe as you could. And we were really pushing that message that things aren't going to be perfect. But as long as you're trying your best and you're working as hard as you can to adhere to that guidance, that's all we can ask of you. And, and it, it does not go missed. And it, it is really appreciated by all the staff at the County FA. Um, only major thing to report at the minute whilst football isn't going on, no one-to-one -one junior coaching. That's all I've got to add to what you've already seen. Uh, the rationale behind that is it requires two DBS, if that's a word, DBS, uh, adults present, um, which obviously does not fall in line with current guidance because if you've got a, a, an under 18 and then two adults, that's not in line with the guidance. Um, even if you have parent and coach and child, that's still two adults, that's not the current guidance. So it cannot take place at all. Adults, if that is something that you're doing, adult one-to-one -one coaching technically is, is allowed because you can meet up with an adult uh, and exercise. Obviously, we recommend that you stick to all the guidance on that and socially distance, etc. But that's the key one um, at the minute. I would ask um, if you do see any advertisements, if you do know of sessions that are happening, it, it, that you do contact us because it's really important that that we are able to then go and remind those people of their responsibilities. Like we said on the previous meeting, it's so, so key um, that when that as a football community, we're not doing anything to um, shoot ourselves in the foot, essentially, for when football is allowed to come back. We don't want to be in a position where the, the local governments don't think we're actually responsible enough to go out and roll that out. So um, as a community, we've got to try and please that. I was really pleased the other day without naming names. There, there was a there was some information around some one to one sessions and a lot of people did comment and, and just remind those involved that it wasn't suitable. Uh, and that's really, really pleasing to see. And it does show how how seriously you're all taking it. So um, thank you for that. So as I said, there's no real update in terms of the guidance. We'll come on to the questions around when's football coming back towards the end, if that's possible. Let's move it along. So we briefly talked about what happens um, when things go wrong, essentially. Um, so I just want to talk about the current COVID guidance breach procedure we've got in place. Um, mute everyone. Uh, there we go bear with me right there we go um so our current covid guidance breach so um early on in covid if you will um any kind of breaches or people breaking the rules um were just kind of being reported and dealt with by whoever it got reported to so there wasn't really a consistent kind of process um like we mentioned previously we were close to losing football prior to lockdown too um because of repeated breaches seen in, in certain areas within the county. So what we have now in place is, is me almost acting as, as a buffer to try and trap and collect any any kind of reports of mismanagement, breaches, rule breakages and, and so on um, to ensure that they're all dealt with kind of fairly and consist consistently. Um, which I think is really key for, for you as clubs, but also for the leagues and the councils to, to, to know that that process is in place. So what I'm promising is that kind of buffer is that at any point of a report, so someone reports, and that could be a member of the general public, it could be from the local council, it could be leagues, it could be opposition clubs, whatever that may be, that I will then give that information to you as a club. So I'll give you the report, I'll give you any evidence that's kind of been sent in, which is generally photographs, um, to allow you to go and investigate that internally, rather than just coming in and saying, you breached that, I can see it on a photo, we're cancelling your game on Sunday, for example. It's not going to be like that. So I'll give you that opportunity to go away and investigate. I'm also here to offer my support uh, and support you with any guidance that you might be unsure of, because some of these breaches might just be a lack of understanding. Um, so we're always going to give you that opportunity to kind of have a look at what's happened, what went wrong. Is it a bad camera angle? Because I, I've had a few of them where the camera angle makes things look a lot worse than in reality what was going on. Um, and the beauty of that is if we have that kind of process in place is I can then feed it back to the relevant people that need to know. And in particular, the local council. Um, if you're not aware, they not the minute, but there are COVID compliance officers out and about, and they will evidence and take photos of any breaches they see. In a, in a sense, they are catching you out so when you're not in line with the rules. Um, and the councils do have quite 
serious concern. So what it's helping me do is go back to them and say, actually, Club A, we've got your report. You've sent the evidence, but actually the mitigation was this. They've now made these three or four changes to their risk assessment. They've um, gone out to all the volunteers to reaffirm the rules and, and we're confident that's not going to happen again. That then gives the, the, the kind of local councils the confidence to allow football to carry on. And that's really, really key that we, we've got that process in place. So it's actually helping us to, to keep the game going, not at the minute, but when things do come back, it's not going to come back guidance free. So we know we're going to be in a similar position um, when that does happen. So we now have a step process in place. Um, so all reports, as I said there, they'll start with a phone call. And to be honest, so far, that's all it's taken. It's been really, really positive experience so far. Um, without naming clubs, I've had a number of conversations where some of the reports, not damning, but the evidence, it, it, it's quite clear there's a photograph or whatever. And you can see that there's been an issue. What's been really pleasing is the response from the club, changing risk assessments, going to the site and moving, for example, ground markers, changing one-way systems, putting up barriers and, and so on, changing kickoff time so we haven't got crossovers. Um, so that process has been extremely positive so far. I'm never going to be calling calling any club up um, to have a to have a go or to be uh, to give you a telling off. It, it isn't that process. Um, so so far it's been really really positive. Um, we've got those three stages. Unfortunately, stage three, if we do get to that point, it is going to be looking at cancellation of fixtures until compliance can be demonstrated. So if we feel that you cannot operate within the guidance you won't play. Um, that's not indefinite. That's until you can prove to us that you're going to, because essentially, without sounding too brutal, we don't want to lose the game because you can't adhere to the rules. So if it's a repeat offence or things that are quite serious, so kind of a flagrant, just ig ig ignoring the rules, for example, that might lead to us jump into steps two and three. We'll do what we see fit to protect the game for everyone. Um, so we are all in this together. We're not there to start telling clubs off and to catch you out. It's really about supporting safe football. Um, so we're looking to kind of stop any serious, anything from getting to a stage three, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, just got a question there. Is stage three for the whole club or team? That will be dependent on what the breach has been. If it's, for example, a facility that cannot prove to us that you can operate games there safely. That might be a club blanket one. If it's a case of um, players are travelling from Derbyshire to play in South Yorkshire, and we know they are because we can see their addresses on their fans, then that would be, for example, that team in particular, we would have to ensure that their games are cancelled until they can prove to us that they're not going to have people crossing the county lines if we're in those tiers. Um, so Char, uh, Charlene, that will just be dependent on the scenario. Um, but like I said, we're really hopeful we don't get to that stage with anyone. And the process so far has worked really well. I'm really pleased with the response from clubs. Not one person's had a moan back. Everyone has gone away, had a little think, um, and then come back to me and said, actually, we've got this nailed in our risk assessment. Here's the risk assessment, send that to the council. And I do, or it might be, we've made this change and I can, can tidy that up, send it to the council and say, look, we, we accept that that happened, but here are the steps the club have put in place. We're very confident that won't happen again. Club are more than happy to engage with the council in the future, things like that. So it's working really well at the minute. So um, thanks to those clubs. And hopefully that's cleared that up for you when we do return um, in the near future. So that kind of, um, leads us on to Leon, who will come in and just talk a little bit around uh, the meeting we had with our leagues last week. In fact, yeah. So before he dives in, if you're not aware, we are running club dates with yourselves and we have league meetings. Uh, they're kind of the league ones are kind of every two to three weeks. Um, so just what we're trying to do is is work together with that, kind of all the stakeholders to ensure that information is getting shared, the right conversations are happening, the right questions are being asked and the right information is getting out. Um, so that's why Leon's on now to hopefully summarise a little bit of the work and the really, really hard work that the leagues in this county are putting in in this current time. Um, so over to Leon. Cheers, Tom. Yeah, I think... Um... Like I say, we've been running these simultaneously with, with Club Day every two, three weeks since the beginning of the season. Uh, a good opportunity where it forced everyone online to, to join us uh, in regards to leagues, uh, covering every league, youth, adult, disability, male, female. So we've got everyone on there uh, and not every 
everyone might have the same issues or concerns, um, but it's a good good place to share good practice like we're doing tonight on this. Uh, there's clubs from all over the place, same as we've got leagues from all over the place and different, like I say, concerns and, and good practice going on. Um, Tom asked me to come on because uh, just to share what we did last Thursday in regards to leagues. Uh, a lot of the questions that I know has been sent into Tom around where where we get where we are, um, if leagues are going to finish, if we're going to have a situation like last season where we had to uh, certainly use points per game, certain leagues expulsion results, um, and in short, we, we we're in the unknown uh, as much as you are and leagues are. But all we can do really is is plan for the best and the worst case scenarios, as it says on there. Um, a good task that we've been doing in leagues since the lockdown was put in place uh, beginning of this month. Uh, we'll start to look at their league fixtures and programmes and the amount of slots that they need, um, where they are, and how many, what percentage of, of fixtures they've got through out of their schedule. Um, and if it's actually a possibility to, to get that best case scenario and finish every single every single game uh, and keep that league integrity in place, because that's what we want. Worst case scenario overall is, is like I said, going back to, to last season, finishing our points per game or explosion results. That's not what we want to do, uh, obviously, but it might be taken out of our hands, unfortunately. The good thing that's that's come from leagues, from the discussions we've had um, since we, we've got put in this situation, is they, they want to try the best and, and put something on, even if it might not be league fixtures, if that's not plausible, whether it's a, a, a small tournament or, or something like that, which I'll, I'll get on to after, uh, after this slide. But as you can see from that grid, it just gives us an idea on the sort of time frames and slots we could have um, and if that's possible for each league. We've got leagues at different stages of the season. Some leagues are bigger than others, so they need larger slots, uh, larger amount of fixture slots. Um, but looking at that best case scenario, coming back the, the, the weekend of when the lockdown's getting reviewed, uh, 20th, 21st of uh, February, uh, and looking at that, there's a, there's a max that you could have 20 odd time slots there, uh, taking into account a few midweeks, and then obviously going to midweek double ones from, from sort of April time. Um, the one thing to, to look at around this is, is we have got a set cut-off date at the end of May, uh, which a lot of leagues, have, for obvious reasons, have already uh, applied to us to extend into. Um, but the FA has made quite a, quite a strong point around that, that they don't want to push into next season, um, into your Junes, into your Julys, because um, we'd rather start fresh next season and hopefully we'll not be in a position where we're, where we're stop-start and having the restrictions and lockdown so we can get a full season for 21-22 without any problems. Um, just a few dates that obviously leagues are looking at as well. Uh, obviously, clock's moving forward and, and Easter weekends and Ramadan, where, where fixtures might have sometimes not been taking place, especially Easter weekend. And might, uh, a league might have, been, uh, have that as a closed weekend. A lot of leagues are looking at that, but obviously they'll be talking to yourselves. Uh, and if you knock onto that next slide, Tom. Yep. The FA have, have provided a range of contingency plans. Um, so like I say, they're looking at, is a, is a full season possible? Uh, and then they've, they've arranged a range of different formats that the leagues can start to look at uh, with, within the league committee. But most importantly, with, the, with yourselves, you might not have heard anything from your leagues yet um, because they just don't know. Um, and we're not pushing them to make any decisions yet because we don't know either. Uh, we're, we're pushing them to just plan for every single scenario, like I say, worst and best case. A um, few ideas around what the FA have thrown at, thrown at least to, to start to think about as well as what they're potentially looking at away from this. Uh, is like I said on that last slide, continue to add additional midweek games. Um, so not really anything new. We've had it in other seasons where we've had seasons where clubs have uh, clubs have played midweek. Uh, leagues have scheduled that in because they've had waterlogged or, or snowed off pitches for whatever reason. They've just had to add that additional midweek near the end of the season just to get those fixtures in. Uh, but it might be the case that we just need more of those. And that'd be brilliant if we if, if that's the only problem that we have to have more midweek midweek uh, games, then we can push that in uh, and keep that league integrity and have a full season. Obviously, there's certain issues with that in regards to if the facilities are going to be available. Uh, and obviously, like Tom alluded to, we're probably still going to come out, out of this with some sort of restrictions in place, whether that's the tier systems in place, the crossing boundaries, whatever that might be. And that's why the FA started to look at other, other options that leagues could look at in regards to circle leagues, trophy events, where these sort of incorporate your tier areas. Uh, now, these are sort of ones where the leagues, it's getting to more of that worst case scenario where the, the full league season is probably not a possibility. Uh, so they're looking at just putting something on. And like I said earlier, we're looking at every league's alluded to me that they want to put something on for their teams, whether that is just some sort of format, 
circle league trophy events and there's a lot of flexibility around these and they need less fixtures so it's something that we can do just moving on from that on the bottom uh, the, the next two split the season uh, something that's been done in, in pro league football before um and i don't know it's been done in different scenarios where it might have been needed splitting the season in half you're keeping the league table you, you've got the case where it might be that every team's played each other once and you, you cut it off there and you cut your table into half thirds or even quarters or even more uh, just to reduce the amount of fixtures and, and fixture slots that you need. Um, but at the end of the day, you've still got that league table. It's not ideal. Um, it might not suit everyone. It might not suit every league. Uh, it's very away from the traditional way of, of playing a league season. Uh, but it's something to look at. Uh, and it's another option. Obviously, it's a season like, like no other. Uh, and then another one, double headers. Uh, another little scenario where you might have a, a team that you've not played before. A league's got two teams that have never played each other all season. They've not even had one fixture against each other so it's a way of fitting in two fixtures in one weekend one fixture slot uh, they're going to be shorter fixtures uh, but they are going to be two complete different results in two complete different games one after the other um, they're going to be shorter games like i said because of welfare reasons for players um, but again there's certain issues with these in regards to they do take a little bit longer on a weekend so you might not have that pitch um booked for that that long or that facility booked for that long um, but again it's another one that leagues we've, we've thrown at least for them to have a look at uh, as an option just just to try and get something in uh, and keep that league integrity like keep alluding to uh, and finally like say organized festivals again comes back down to will these be allowed we'll be able to put something like this on and um, but it's another idea that the leagues are potentially looking at to to put some sort of football some sort of competitive edge to the game as well um instead of just that league league fixtures because they might not be able to to fit them all in and like i said others um leagues are looking at these you might have certain ideas as well um, and share those with your league, share them with us. Um, there might be something that we've not thought about that might fit perfectly for your specific league. Um, and that's something that we want to hear about. We're always looking for ideas. So let us know if that's something that you're thinking about. Uh, and don't be frightened. Any idea is a good idea at the point. At this point, it's it's not a, a season like over, like I say. And so it probably is going to be a little bit different. Just flick back one more time. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was, Jumped ahead. I was Just that last time. To the top when I clicked the <laughs> Yeah, just the last point on the bottom, guys. Like I say, you've probably not heard off all your off your leagues, or you might not have had much from your leagues, just because they've got not not that much to report to you, except from the suspension in football. Um, so because of that, they will be probably coming to you at some point if they're going to put anything new in place, because they have to. It's your league at the end of the day. You're the you're the members. You you vote on anything that changes. Um, so if there is something where they're looking to take on one of these ideas or something different. That will have to come to you in the form of an SGM or an online meeting like this tonight. Um, but they will be in touch. Uh, and that's something we've, we've, we've been trying to push throughout all this time, being keeping your communication up with your clubs. We can't do it in person, but I know a lot of have run league meetings like this online uh, or, or, or WhatsApp groups or whatever that might be, just to stay in touch with yourselves and, and keep the comms back and forth. Go on, Tom. Uh, and finally, guys, just around what, what else we touch on at the league forums. We... we Obviously, it's uh, like Tom says with the club dates, it's been a lot around restrictions and guidance and uh, lockdowns in football. But ideally, we want these meetings, jumping ahead again, Tom, we want these meetings uh, like Club Day, like the League Forums, to be more around development, which we do try and touch on. Uh, but like I said, they've been took over by the lockdown, the restrictions and the guidance. Uh, and this is what we're doing with leagues as well. We're looking at using this downtime effectively uh, to FA Charter Standard leagues that might not be FA Charter Standard and work with their clubs to get that status up to seek the benefits um, of, of being an FA Charter Standard league or a club. Uh, league development plans, we always ask leagues to look at the short-term and long-term goals. Where do, they, where do they see the league in in one season, in five seasons, right down the road? Do they want to add any new pathways? And that brings on to the next point, so there's gaps in, gaps in provision. Do they want to add a new new age group, uh, a new format to, to their arm, uh, a vets football, whatever it might be? Uh, and that's something that you can look look to do in your club. Uh, your club might be a single team club. It might be one of the bigger clubs that have their own facilities and, and cater for nearly every single pathway. Uh, but there might be something that there's a gap in your pathway, in your, in your club that you want to expand into and use this downtime to look at if it's needed, if there's a need for it, like I say, and, and how to get that going. That's something we can support you through during this downtime. Team and player consultation. Claire's talked a lot about player consultation, speaking to young people, but speaking to all your players, all your teams during this time to understand where their thoughts are around football, what they kind of see your club shaping. 
um, in the future. Again, coming back to those short-term, long-term goals. Uh, and then, like I said, we, we're, asking, we're looking to do a lot of this as well in regards to team and player consultation. And uh, I know a lot of leagues are looking at doing it if they've not done so already. And then finally, some, some just other little points that we threw at leagues, but also um, are very valid for yourselves. Uh, the national Nationwide Mutual Respect Award for Grassroots Football. Uh, that's something that we pushed out last week. Um, and it's, it's a really good one just to nominate anyone that you know has been really, really good during this this time, this season, this, this sort of stop and start, this, this season like no other, like I said earlier, uh, just to award them and for their hard work. And obviously it's in line with respect, uh, but it's something to look at and just just a bit of a feel of the story around obviously the, the negative side to what we've, what we've dealt with this season. And then just a final point on there, again, using this downtime effectively. We've, we've thrown this out to leagues that are a lot of, a lot of using it, uh, but it's also available to clubs, teams, uh, new individuals that might be new volunteers at your club, new coaches, new managers that um, might might be new to completely coach and new to foot, grassroots football. Uh, we're looking at putting some FAIT support sessions on. Uh, now, these are open to anyone and anyone, like I said, and it could be as long as a 10 minute little phone call uh, or, or up to an hour with a, a full team or club, whatever that's needed on full time, whole game, match day app, whatever that might be. Uh, let us know if that's something that you're interested in and we can put you in a time slot with myself. Uh, I think that's everything from me, Tom. Um, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Uh, there's some quite interesting uh, bits and bobs going into the, into the chat. I've, I have noted, I've just wrote on there, I'm noting it all down. Like I said on the slide before Leon spoke, this is kind of uh, that feedback model. We will feed this all back to your leagues. Like Leon said also, leagues do want to hear your opinion. So if you have got any concerns, maybe wait for them to propose what they're looking at doing when they know a little bit more. Um, but if you do have ideas or you do want to raise some points, they'd be more than happy to listen um, to the feedback. And I've just written there. If you want to delve into you, what you've put in the in the chat a little bit deeper now as we head into the Q&A, please feel free to do that because um, obviously we want to hear from you. And again, if you've got any questions during this time, um, feel free now to, to pop your hand up and we can come to you. Um, I do have a few questions that you sent in, so I'll hopefully get them answered too. Um, but before we do go on to that, just as Leon said there, using this time wisely, um, he mentioned Charter Standard. Any junior clubs on here that are, that are non-Charter Standard, you will have either heard from me in the last seven days or you'll be hearing from me in the next seven to 14 days. Um, as all of our junior leagues are Charter Standard, it's a requirement for them that you get your accreditation. So loads of clubs are currently applying at the minute. The process is not as awful as it's sometimes made out. We've got some great guidance documents. We've got some great supporting documents. Um, and it's not just a box ticking exercise. It's a really good opportunity to have a look at your internal processes at, and improve as a club. Um, and I know we all think that we're doing things the best way. We like that at work. We like that within clubs, whatever that may be. Um, but there's a great, it's a great opportunity to have a little look at your processes uh, and maybe make some improvements for the benefit of your club. Um, so over to questions. If you've got any, raise your hand and then we can get you unmuted. Um, Paul's just said there, can you send the slides out? Yes, what I'll do is I'll send a, a follow-up email tomorrow. I will send a recording of this. I will send the slide deck and I'll put the mental health ones on separately on a PDF as well. And that way you've got them to hand and they'd be really easy then to chuck into a WhatsApp group uh, or chuck in a in an email that goes straight out to any one of your members. So any questions or anyone want to speak, particularly about what Leon's just mentioned at the end, uh, Feel free. Did I just answer a few questions in the chat? So on my way. If I've like, missed any. Yeah, I'll just I'll just nosy back through. Obviously, once I've done my bit. Um, Chris has put why are we restricted from finishing the fixtures by the deadlines? I don't know if you put that in before. I made the point around um, the cut off being sunny time. The FA are looking at it, but the, the overarching consensus seems to be that they want this to be uh, a cut that we caught off at, at the same time we would any other season, just so we can start fresh and it's not moving into the next one. Uh, not We're not getting a, a rolling on issue uh, if this continues. Um, but like I said, it, it's continually getting looked at. Uh, the other issue with that is player registrations do um expire at the end of may uh, and also a few club insurances might at that point uh, so there's a few different scenarios in regards to that 
Um, we had a hand go just... up there and, but disappeared. Say again? I'm sure we had a hand go up and it's disappeared. Um, uh, just while I'm waiting on that one, we have some questions posted in. Uh, in fact, let's let Chris jump in because he's probably replying to what you've just said there, Leon. Chris, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Leon. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah, we've previously had discussions with the uh, Doncaster League yeah. um, and Mike Drummond mm -hmm. in regards to um, the Don uh, creating a Doncaster Girls League. I don't know, you're probably aware of. Uh, and one of the things that was discussed was potential for, and I know we are where we're at with this season and what we've got, um, long term, somewhere in the future, potential for a sort of spring league, spring summer league and a autumn league for uh, girls. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I really do think we need to push for going forward. Um, I mean, we've had the comfort of knowing the last two weekends we've had pretty poor weather and the fixtures would have probably been off anyhow. Yeah. So I really do think um, the leagues need to consider this going forward. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's something that you have talked about in the past. It's uh, unfortunately, it's some, one of these, it's an FA rule. So it's took out. I know it is, mate. I get that. Like I say, the, we're always looking to modernise the game um, and looking at different ways around that. Uh, and the FAR in discussions, especially, like this is kind of pushing them that way. Um, but then I think it's from the conversations I've had with the FA, it's, it's looking like it, they, they do want to just cut it off for, for the, yeah. the, the end of May, just so they can start fresh again uh, yeah. for everyone's benefit. Um, in regards to a spring-summer league, um, I imagine it'd be ran similar to your, to your summer tournaments that uh, a lot of clubs hold and, and bits like that. Um, I'm aware of the league. The, the I nice. think there is a you know a, a definite cry for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know. Uh, yeah. No. But I think it would you know prove really good. You know I think there's a, a call for it. So yeah, yeah. The, Thanks for listening. Loads of gaps. Yeah. Uh, cheers, Chris. Uh, Ashley Thanks, asks, guys. if the season finishes due to current COVID situation, where does this leave clubs with affiliations? Would this run out? Um, would this run out or would it run out on the day of the expiry? So your affiliation will end on the end date of the season. Um, if that is extended, which like Leon said, there's no guarantee that it's one of the options being uh, looked at, then your affiliation would, I think, would automatically extend. What you would need to consider, as Leon said, is that your insurance may be dated not in line with that. So your insurance may expire um, prior to that affiliation if it's extended. So um, you, you will be affiliated for this season. When this season finishes, your affiliation will finish and that process will start again. Obviously, the fees were waived at affiliation level um, this year. There's obviously no guarantee that that will be the case for next year, but you will obviously have to affiliate to, to play organised football next year. That just bring me on to a number of people have asked around rebate for league fees if the leagues are cancelled. That's something that we cannot answer as a county FA. That would be a league matter and something you need to raise there. Um, I know that some leagues, similar to us, uh, what well, some leagues adjusted their registration fees for this year, whether that was zero or they adjusted them. Um, again, that, that might be something they look at doing going to next season but again that'll be totally league dependent so questions around that would need to be to your league um obviously just be um considerate of, of the predicament that they're in as well the league might not be in the best position financially due to the last 12 18 months so it might it might be something that cannot happen if the league is to continue so just be considerate um if you are approaching leagues asking around that um but at the minute, it's not something that we could comment on uh, in regards to rebates for league fees. Obviously, there was no affiliation fee, so there's nothing um, to rebate there. Um, as the vaccine is being rolled out, will players need to uh, be vaccinated prior to playing? Can't comment on that. And unfortunately, I can see that a number of the questions will probably end up in that down that route. I can imagine when football does return, that it will be in similar line with the guidance we had before. Um, so I, I can't believe that vaccination is going to be mandated to play because at the end of the day, generally, it's going to be the lower aged part of the population that will be playing football and they will be last on the list to get vaccinated. So 
I can't see that being the position of the government, but we will wait and see what the guidance is as it comes out. As you're well aware, it will come from the government approval first. They will go through depart, uh, Department of Media and Culture and Sport, who will work with the FA to get the guidance in place that we will then circulate. So that will be the process, but I, I would be shocked if that is um, is part of the, of the guidance to play. When does the next season start usually? Leon, help me out. Uh, August, August, September, depending on the league. Um, obviously, they, they usually ensure that all the teams are affiliated first before they jump in, uh, but it more swings towards September time. And affiliation window will open in July, that's correct, isn't it? We open in July. The minute so, you're affiliated, you can play organised football, as long as the guidance says you can. Um, so, to play any friendlies, um, anything like that, you would need to be affiliated, uh, which we normally do from the kind of first, second week of July. There's normally about a month gap between the season uh, kind of ending and then we affiliate something along those lines. Um, anything else? Coaching qualifications was asked um, prior to the meeting. There's no date yet again. Unfortunately, it will be when it's safe to return. Um, more online opportunities for coach education are incoming. So obviously we will circulate that to clubs as and when that happens. But it's all I can say at the moment, but more online opportunities for coach education are incoming. So whilst we've got those interim measures, we're hoping for a little bit more formal online learning. Um, so that is incoming. Um, Claire Charlene has asked about welfare officer training. Do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, if you go to the FA, if actually even if you just Googled um, FA welfare officer training, it'd take you to that page on the boot room where you can sign up for the virtual classroom. Uh, virtual classroom costs £25. I think it takes about two hours for the course delivery. And there's a number of dates through January and also dates now extending into February as well. They are going to review it for a couple of weeks in February um, possibly alter it a little bit. But yeah, the welfare officer course is there. Everybody who's a welfare officer now needs to get themselves booked onto that. If they've not done the Safeguard and Children workshop, um, whoever it is needs to get in touch with education at the fa.com uh, and with the with the uh, subject title of open um, safeguarding recertification. Because what they've done is they've... It's, Normally, when you do the Safeguard and Children workshop, after three years, you can do an online recertification. Um, but they're opening that up for club welfare officers because it's it's more in depth than the safeguarding for all. Tom, there's a few hands up um, if you uh, want to go to them first. How do I see who's got the hand up? Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Kirsty, do you want to unmute yourself? Sorry about that. Um, it was just I'm talking without unmuting. I've been doing it all week at school. Um, I um, I booked onto the safeguarding. I've done all the um, all the other ones. It was just the main one that we paid twenty five pound for. Booked onto it and then went down with COVID and was ill. Um, do I just literally rebook and repay? I think that would probably be best. Well, I think actually the best thing to do is to email education at the fa.com, explain the circumstance and see if there is any way that you could get um, a rebate. Education is now not a county FA um, responsibility. It now does sit with the FA. So education at the fa.com um, to see if you could maybe get that money uh, back in some way. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, Carl, John and myself. Hey Tom. Hey, how are we doing? I'm just thinking about the affiliation. That's all. Um, obviously, yeah. the courses have got to be booked on the level ones and stuff like. That. Are you going to bypass this uh, this season with obviously not being able to have co courses and stuff like that? Uh, it'll all be that'll all be communicated at the time. At point of the heart, you're testing me because I'm totally out of affiliation mode in the middle of January. Requirements at affiliation, is, Claire, help me out on this. DBS. Yeah for youth team coaches, yep. in date DBS, and is safeguarding mandatory at the point of affiliation for youth teams? No, um, but there has to be somebody with the safeguarding qualification. Yeah, in, in the team, there has to be somebody that's got that. So the it's mandatory for all coaches to have yeah, it, assisting coaches. coaches. Yeah, the coaching qualification is not mandatory at that point of affiliation. That's more surrounding your annual health check. Um, it's all online and stuff like that now. Say that again, sorry. 
we're definitely all going to be online ready for it um, because obviously we it, there might be clubs what don't have it and can't get affiliated. Yeah, so the D, the DBS situation can be can be done not whilst we're in lockdown as we are, but when things do relax, we can get DBSs um, sorted, and they're the minimum uh, requirement there for the coaches. In terms of the coaching stuff, um, that's obviously less important at the at point of affiliation. It's looking more and more like that's going to go online. I know someone's just asked a question around first aid going online. We're unsure yet. Your problem with the first aid course is, is the requirement of that kind of face-to-face -face element to prove your knowledge and, and demonstrate some of the uh, techniques and requirements for um, CPR and things like that. So I don't know yet where the first aid course will fit. Um, but hopefully we'll have some answers on that if it's if we're still in so, a similar situation to we are now where face-to-face -face courses can't happen we'll be on those interim measures and the two uh, online modules will be enough at that point it'll be more an annual health check where the qualifications so for example each youth team need a coach with level one first aid safeguarding and everyone needs their dbs that's mm -hmm. mandatory requirement an annual health check whereas at affiliation it's the dbs that's the mandatory mm -hmm. uh, mandatory point Right, cheers. All right, Carl. Uh, I'm just going to go back on the chat. Uh, in regard, non leak is a plant. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading through. Is that for new officers? Charlene, you said, is that for new officers? I presume you're meaning the welfare officer course. Yes, that's what new welfare officers. Um, that have become a welfare officer recently. The FA did change the rules so we could get them on the system, even if they didn't have the workshop at that time. Um, but that will change again now that the offer's there. Uh, Leon, I would like to pass Jamie Gamble's question on to you, if possible. I think it's surrounding kind of not the difference between grassroots and non-league and what's going on at that end of things. In regards to elite football, step three to step six. Um, uh, yeah, he's putting on the. Yourself, yeah. I mean, just clarify what you mean, just so I'm not answering something that you don't mean. <laughs> if you're still there, Jenny. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. So obviously, with with developmental football, obviously we can't. The, it, that can't really end in like like splitting leagues and stuff like that, and like a mini tournament. So is there any plan to actually push something along in in regards to finishing that league, or would that like be be like it were with with last season? It, it'd probably be, I'm, I'm speaking on the FA's behalf, it, it, it'd probably be, again, we're in the unknown, um, but it'd probably, like you say, on the lines of last season, there's certain areas that you could squeeze it into. I know it's not as flexible as the, the traditional leagues uh, in grassroots, um, but yeah, worst case scenario, Nathan's got his hand in if he wants to jump in. I don't know if that's what he's for. <laughs> hi, Liam. Hi, everybody. So for the NLS they're looking at every single scenario possible um, and surveys have gone out to steps three to six. Now, regional feeder leagues, uh, which are done by the county, but a part of that pyramid. So it's a county senior league in this neck of the woods. Um, again, that's going to that's more discussions ongoing this week around. I think the fundamental message is we are looking at every single possibility, what we can do. But we don't know the start date, so we're doing no end of scenario planning. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, uh, but that's that's the word that's ongoing at the minute. So it's not forgotten about. It's very much on people's agenda, um, and it's at the minute it's survey gathering information around where leagues are. So uh, the guys here have done some really good work around each individual division within a league, uh, where where they are, what how many possible playing weeks they need left. Um, so it's still ongoing, um, but there's no definite answer. But it's not forgotten about. Yeah, I think that's definitely the key. The key message there is that the work is going on. Um, the work is going on. Um, it's just a case of what the scenario is going to be um, when we get that green light. Um, hi Tom, does the FA Playmaker online replace level one, or is that additional learning? So as an interim measure, yes. So it put for. Um, for a team to be recognised having a qualified coach, so annual health check chart standard, the FA Playmaker is currently sitting there as 
as you being qualified. So if you've got that, yes, it sits underneath a level one. So if you've got a level one, it would just be CPD to drop down and do the playmaker. It would not be a requirement. Um, so yes, the FA playmaker currently is replacing the level one um, for the compliance for charter standard, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Cheers, Tom. Thank you. Um, in fact, I just want to... Someone did ask, and I don't know if they're still on here, just regarding um, funding around when things kind of return to normal, funding around pitches. That'll be something that that we'll, we'll go back to clubs and we'll, we'll um, share that information as and when it happens. But the funding will still be there, but nearly all... Uh, funding, particularly Football Foundation, is on pause currently. So it's almost pause. So people were uh, halfway through an application process or just starting out or may have done the majority and it was waiting for approval or whatever that may be. It's been paused and they'll communicate with you as and when those things start to kind of start up again. Um, it's difficult for us at the minute because we don't have a facilities officer. We are working as a team to kind of cover that off. So um, we will hopefully start to start to churn out a little bit more in terms of comms in those areas over the next weeks and months. I think that is all the pre, oh, there was one more pre question. Um, so one questioned around different rules, different councils having different rules surrounding alcohol sales and things like that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there shouldn't be differing uh, guidance between different councils unless we're at situations where we're in different tiers. Um, the guidance comes from government level, so it shouldn't be a case of in Sheffield, you're allowed to have takeaway food and drink in your stadium, but if you were in Rotherham, you couldn't. When we were in that same, um, within that same tier system, the guidance should remain consistent across them. It would only be if, for example, you were a Derbyshire-based club and you may have been in tier two and we were in tier three, there may be differences between hospitality there, um, but that shouldn't be happening where there's inconsistency within our within our kind of county, if that makes sense. Um, so last chance for anyone, if we've got any hands or anyone wants to shout up. Um, just a reminder, we'll get this sent out to you tomorrow with the recording uh, and any links that we've mentioned anything that's cropped up in the chat. And like I said, I'll be feeding back to the leagues also, um, your feedback surrounding leagues recommencing um, and the issues for you as clubs around that. It's really important that they get those messages. So thank you all that have managed to stay on until the end. Um, if things change prior to our kind of scheduled next meeting, which will be in about four weeks time, we'll obviously have a special special edition to cover any guidance or any changes that, um, that are mandated.